We're going to continue our discussion of the relationship between faith and reason by talking about what are called motives of credibility. And you read a whole chapter from Feingold on these motives of credibility. I wanted to go through just the basic idea of, of what these are and why they exist and why they're important and, and how they play into this relationship between faith and reason, how they make it that the ascent of faith is by no means a blind impulse of the mind, right? Um, we don't ascend to faith to what God has revealed simply on a whim or as a mere matter of sentiments or because we happen to feel like it one day. The idea here is that if one asks why believe that revelation occurred here and not there, we could give some sort of a, of a response so that the believer has comfort in the fact that their faith is indeed in accord with reason and also gives the unbeliever a uh, pause to consider maybe there's something to this Catholic faith after all. And we'll turn again as we have been to Vatican I, Dei Filius. Uh, we actually looked at this chapter before on faith. Um, I believe it's chapter three off the top of my head. Uh, we looked at it when we talked about the definition of faith, but I left out these few points here that talk about the motives of credibility in relationship to faith. So here's what Vatican I says. In order that the submission of our faith should be in accordance with reason. Now notice, uh, even though faith is above reason, um, that doesn't mean faith is unreasonable, that it's contrary to reason, that reason just goes out the door. No, our faith is in accordance with reason. We're rational beings, after all. We seek reason. So our faith should at least be in accord with reason. So in order that the submission of our faith should be in accord with reason, it was God's will that there should be linked to the internal assistance of the Holy Spirit external indications of his revelation. So uh, it's positing two things here, one which it already talked about uh, previously which is these internal helps of the Holy Spirit, this grace to recognize truth, uh, the truth of the faith when it's presented to us, to make us, uh, to make our hearts and minds co-natural to supernatural things. Those are these internal assistances of the Holy Spirit. This says, well, besides that, God willed that there be also external indications of his revelation, that we could point to something and say that, that's why it makes sense to think that God revealed himself here and maybe not there. It goes on to say, uh, that is, these external indications, that is to say, divine acts, acts of God, and it names them, first and foremost, miracles and prophecies, right? Miracles, acts of God uh, that that uh, go beyond the natural order, a truly extraordinary and supernatural act, as well as prophecies, things that uh, point to future realities, right? Which clearly demonstrating, as they do, the omnipotence and infinite knowledge of God, right? His ability to work miracles and to work prophecies are the most certain signs of revelation and are suited to the understanding of all. So the idea here is where one finds miracles and fulfilled prophecies, these are outward external indications that in that place one finds a true revelation of God. So Vatican I's Dei Filius roots this already in the, the economy of salvation, of God's work of salvation, points to the Old Testament and to Christ. Hence, Moses and the prophets, us, uh, and especially Christ our Lord worked many absolutely clear miracles and delivered prophecies. So it's pointing us to uh, the testimony in the scriptures uh, of Christ's uh, miracles and the prophecies of the Old Testament uh, and there are many, many in varied forms. Uh, again, we don't have time to go into individual ones in this video, but uh, in a footnote in Feingold, he actually lays out uh, dozens of these messianic prophecies in the Old Testament and talks about Christ's miracles. And then it goes on, not only were these um, external signs, these motives of credibility attached to Christ's ministry and before him Moses, but also the apostles. It says of the apostles we read, and they, the apostles, went forth and preached, uh, uh, and preached, I think that should be everywhere, uh, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that attended it. So there we have these 
outward signs attending the preaching of the apostles. If I was listening to the apostles in the year 33, 34 AD, and I asked, how do I know that their message is an authentic revelation of God? The idea here is that, well, they were attended by these signs, by these miracles. Uh, and again, Second Peter 1.19 says, it is written, we have the prophetic word. This is Peter writing. We have the prophetic word made more sure. You will do well to pay attention to this as a lamp shining in a dark place. So both uh, the Old Testament and then Christ and then the apostles have both the testimony of miracles and uh, and prophecy to back up the claim that that revelation has happened here. So what are these motives of credibility? What do we mean? They're the reasons upon which rest our judgment of credibility. That is to say, at some point, when we consciously ask the question, why do I believe that Christ is the Son of God? Why do I believe the testimony of the scriptures? Why do I believe the testimony of the apostles? Why do I believe the testimony of the church? Whatever the answer to that question is, that's what our judgment of credibility is based on. I judge Christ to be credible in what he said and did. I trust the scriptures to be credible in what they relate about the truth of Jesus Christ. I trust the church to be credible in handing on the full purity and totality of the apostolic message. Well, what is my judgment that those things are credible, those mediators? What does that rely on? So notice we're not asking about the reliability primarily of, of we're not talking about the credibility of God, right? Uh, faith is based on God's testimony, who we judge to be true because he is God. This is not that. We're not calling into question God's credibility. We're asking about judging that the mediators that claim to be speaking the divine message, that they are credible. So the motives of credibility are what move me to make the judgment that these witnesses of revelation are credible, these human mediators. This judgment of credibility establishes that God has revealed himself here rather than elsewhere, and that the Catholic doctrine is credible and should therefore be believed because of the authority of God who is revealing it. So we're not questioning God's revelation at this point. We're questioning the human mediators. Uh, is it credible to believe that God's revealed himself in this context and not the other, right? So in other words, is it possible to establish that there are sufficient grounds for a free and reasonable decision that Christianity is a real revealed religion, and, and more even, that uh, the church, that the Catholic Church is the church established by Christ, mediating the apostolic message. On, on what is that judgment based? These are motives of credibility. So you can see here again, faith and reason working in harmony. I have faith because God has revealed something. But how do I know where God has revealed himself? Well, here's some of the preambles of faith, the work of reason, that are moved by these motives of credibility. And again, what are they? Well, uh, there are certain signs, chiefly miracles and prophecies. And this would be miracles, by the way, uh, and prophecies, particularly uh, miracles and prophecies of the biblical period, certainly, but also miracles today. Every time we canonize a saint, there are miracles involved. The church points to miracles of, of um, Eucharistic miracles that are worthy of our belief, to Marian apparitions that are worthy of belief. I would guess if we polled um, our class, some of us have encountered miracles, right? That these are motives of credibility for us. They, they point to the divine origin of the Christian religion. They, they don't necessarily prove it. The, 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 the choice for faith is still a free one. Our, our, our intellects are not compelled to it, but they give this rational grounding to it. They indicate that it's possible to distinguish faith from gullibility or wishful thinking. And this is maybe an important point here in this rapport between faith and reason. If I say I have faith in the God of the universe, who is a trinity, who became incarnate in Christ, who died and rose again, how is that different from saying I have faith in a flying spaghetti monster, or faith in a teapot orbiting Jupiter, or faith in the fairy, uh, fairy godmother, or faith in the uh, tooth fairy, or Santa Claus, or any other thing like that, right? What's the difference between faith and gullibility or wishful thinking? And the answer here, or an answer at least, is that faith has this rapport, this relationship, this symbiosis with reason. 
that it's motives of credibility that give us reason to think that here and not there God has revealed himself and therefore I can reasonably place my make my act of faith in God who has revealed. This doesn't exclude, however, this works in tandem with, in other words, the internal helps of grace and the agreement of the doctrines that we have with reason. So the idea here is that we have both the external motives of credibility, but also the internal help of grace and the internal um, rationality uh, of the doctrines themselves. So these motives, we, we want to look, uh, and I want to highlight this again as an important uh, point to, to, to emphasize, motives of credibility in this sense are not the same as the motives for faith. And, and that's very important that we don't mix these up. Because if we mix these up, then faith is simply reduced to the rational. Then I could simply um, argue my way into the faith. I should be able to argue anyone into the faith. I should simply be able to present them with, uh, with these motives of credibility and they should simply see it. Um, faith the motive of faith is different than the motive of credibility. The motive of faith is intrinsic to faith. It's the authority of God who reveals. Once I believe it's rational that to, to think that God has revealed himself here, say in Christ, in the biblical witness, in, in the people of Israel, once it's credible to me that God has revealed himself there, the act of faith is believing what he says. Right? So I don't believe what God has revealed because that has suddenly become clear to me, that uh, the, the intrinsic truth of it all. No, I have faith because God has revealed. What God has revealed, I assent to whether or not my mind comprehends it in its totality. That's different than motives of credibility, which are extrinsic to faith. They pertain to the, pre the preambles or the preface to faith, right? Motives of credibility say, why is it reasonable to think God has revealed himself in Christ or through the church or in holy scriptures rather than elsewhere. That's motives of credibility. Once I see that, the ascent of faith is next, right? The ascent of faith is because God reveals, I believe it. Those are two different movements. The motives of credibility prepare for faith. They point towards faith. Uh, they remove stumbling blocks that might be in the way of faith, but they don't, um, they don't uh, substitute for faith. And in fact, many authors say once one has faith, one no longer needs the motives of credibility. They drop out. Uh, once, once I know that God has revealed, I don't need to continually uh, go back to those motives of faith, right? In times of doubt, they may reassure me, but why I believe that the Trinity is a Trinity is not because of these motives of credibility, but simply because God has revealed it. So uh, to, to sum that up, just notice the difference to the, of these two because we don't reduce faith to mere rationality. The two are symbiotic. They work in relationship. One points to the other, but they're not, one does not substitute for the other. So the question here is not the credentials of God or the credibility of what he says, but the credibility of the statement that God has spoken here. In other words, what are the motives of credibility of the statement that God has revealed this or that um, rather than the truth of what God has actually revealed? And we see this, the idea of, of motives of credibility in the life of Jesus. We saw a little bit in Dave Filius. Here's another example. When uh, in Matthew, it says, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them. And look what Jesus does. He gives them motives of credibility. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. So the idea being, look, John, what do you see? Here are these motives of credibility. Once one has made that judgment of credibility that Christ is to be listened to, then once then what Christ says can be taken as a uh, I guess, suppose, pun intended, gospel truth, right? So the preambles of faith here, the motives of credibility lead to faith in what Christ has said without, um, without substituting for it. Uh, again, uh, we have um, 
uh, Jesus, the testimony which I have, Jesus says uh, in the Gospel of John, but the testimony which I have is greater than that of John the Baptist. For the works which the Father has granted me to accomplish, these very works which I am doing, bear witness, bear me witness that the Father has sent me. These are motives of credibility. How do we know that Christ was sent by the Father? John, uh, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, it's because of the works I do. Therefore, what I say is trustworthy. And we already saw this in Mark 16, uh, that the same thing happened with the apostles. De Filius then goes on to talk about motives of credibility pertaining to the church. So it starts out Old Testament, Christ, the apostles, right? Is Christianity uh, a, a divine religion based in the person of Christ? And we say yes. And the motives of credibility are the prophecies that pointed to him and the miracles fulfilled either by him or in his name. But then the next step is, what about the church? Um, is there any reason to think that the Catholic Church, um, amongst all the churches and communities, is uh, the bearer of this divine message in a unique way? And so Dei Filios lay, lays out what we can call motives of credibility pertaining to the church. It says, so that we could fulfill our duty of embracing the true faith, and of persevering unwaveringly in it, unwaveringly in it, God, through his only begotten Son, founded the church. And he endowed his institution with clear notes to the end that she might be recognized by all as the guardian and teacher of the revealed word. So the idea is, uh, in order for Christ's revelation and message to be handed on in its totality and purity, he established a church. But the same question has to be asked of the, of the church. Is it credible that this church here, rather than that church there, has this unique role of being instituted by Christ as the bearer of his message? So he says, to the Catholic Church alone, uh, this is De Filius, to the Catholic Church alone belong all those things, so many and so marvelous, which have been divinely ordained to make for the manifest credibility of the Christian faith. And it's going to point some of these out. Well, what are these things manifest about the church? that point to its credibility in handing on the faith. It says, what is more, the church herself, by reason of her astonishing propagation, that is, how is it that this institution begun on a number of, Gal uh, begun by a number of Galilean farmer, uh, farmers, huh? Galilean fishermen, how is it that that institution prop has propagated itself, has spread to every corner of the planet, uh, has become as influential as it has, has endured in time, uh, now has 1.1 billion members, uh, it would seem that a merely human institution couldn't do that. Uh, her outstanding holiness and her inexhaustible fertility in every kind of goodness. Now, admittedly, this one cuts in two different directions. Because if the holiness of the church and her goodness are motives of credibility, then most certainly... Um, her sinful members are strike against that, are, um, are testify perhaps uh, in contradiction to its true nature. So this is really talking about uh, looking at those members of outstanding holiness, the saints, the martyrs, the doctors of the church, the, uh, the incomparable good the church does uh, as a humanitarian institution or humanitarian outreach, I would say, right? This isn't to say every member of the church is holy, and quite certainly, I forget who said it now, but th th there is the, the, the flip side of that, that, the greatest argument against Christianity is Christians. So we have to understand what's being said here and, and say um, it's referring to a particular aspect of the holiness of the church. It goes on to talk about by reason of the church's Catholic unity and her unconquerable stability. That is, it's unity. How is it that a, a, an institution 2,000 years old has remained one under one visible head, the Holy Father, throughout these years? The idea is that any merely human institution would have broken up and shattered long ago, um, especially considering some of the evil popes we've had uh, over the millennium. Um, and the fact that this is uh, an institution run by sinful, fallen, imperfect human beings. Uh, it's unconquerable stability. Uh, how many different uh, uh, empires and kingdoms and individuals have tried to undermine and, uh, and destroy the church and have been unable to? Again, you start putting all of this together and it's, it's a kind of a cumulative argument for the credibility of the church that this stuff perhaps doesn't make sense 
unless the church is what she claims to be. All of this is a kind of great and perpetual motive of credibility, credibility and an incontrovertible evidence of her own divine mission. So we can look at these as converging and convincing arguments. Now, first of all, with any of these, we could go into them in more detail. What do we mean by prophecies? Well, let, we could look at some examples. What do we mean by miracles? Do, are, do miracles actually happen? Do they happen today? What evidence do we have of that? Those are valid questions that uh, a, a, a seeker would want to dig into. Um, what of the Catholic Church? Are these, are these claims compelling that... Uh, there is something about its constitution that just defies explanation, right? So um, the, the idea here is any one of these foregoing motives of credibility might not be and probably isn't sufficient to move one to see the reasonableness of Christian revelation, right? One prophecy could be happenstance, a uh, good guess, right? One miracle could be brushed off as uh, just an unexplainable happenstance, right? Uh, but putting them all together, right? Um, there's this cumulative effect. Uh, perhaps the church's universality isn't that impressive, but what about its stability over the ages? And what about those early martyrs who, who died for the faith? And you put that all together. And the idea here is taken together, they form a case of converging and convincing arguments towards the credibility of revelation here uh, rather than there. Um, again, the point being of all of this is the harmony of faith and reason. The idea that faith is not a blind motion of, of the human intellect, but is undergirded by reason. Reason doesn't supplant faith. Our faith isn't reduced to simple arguments and reason, but the two work in harmony and in tandem with one another. Coupled with these external motives, and, and I'll end on this, Coupled with these external motives are also the recipient's antecedent desires and expectations. So these, these aren't, um, strictly speaking, motives of credibility as external signs, but they are things that move an individual um, to see the credibility of the faith, right? Antecedent desires and expectations. If the human person, in searching for truth, uh, first of all, uh, the one antecedent expectation or desire is to seek truth, right? Another is that that truth uh, should resonate with the deepest experience of the human heart, the deepest longings of the human heart for reconciliation, for love, for acceptance, uh, for atonement, for, for wrongdoing. It should be in accord with our conscience. All of these different questions and expectations that a person brings is going to affect how they receive these motives of, cred of credibility. And to the degree that uh, a faith answers those questions and expectations and desires, that itself proves uh, a motive for the credibility that revelation occurred uh, he here rather than there. So I think we can leave motives of credibility here for the moment and have some more time to discuss it in class on Monday.